The year was 69 BC. A man stood by a statue of Alexander the Great. He shed a tear in his sorrow, contemplating that at his age, Alexander had conquered most of the known world, while he had achieved nothing. Or so the Greekoid revisionists would tell you, but fuck all that. The truth is, only a very few know the true tale behind the greatest of the Romans. It is then my pleasure to welcome you plebs to the life story of Gaius Julius Caesar. Through the centuries since its founding, Rome had been faced with all the typical challenges to a civilized society. Barbarians, plebs, angry women, and it was in this turbulent world that Caesar found himself as an adult. Born a patrician prodigy, Caesar spent his political career quickly rising through the ranks of the Republic. Elected a tribune, a quaestor, and an aedile, throwing lavish games to entertain the plebeian masses. But it was not a life lacking tragedy, suffering the losses of both his loved aunt and wife's lives. But he didn't let such losses dissuade him from his ambitions. As a man of divine lineage, Caesar ran for and easily won the election for Pontifex Maximus, as well as one for becoming a praetor, an office lower only to the consul, by then a senator named Cicero, belonging to the many Italians Rome had civilized in the past. Being a skilled orator and an autistically strict constitutionalist, Cicero conflicted with Caesar over the Cataline conspiracy. It was basically just some bitter popularis whom, after losing the election for consul, twice, threw a tantrum and tried to overthrow the Republic. By the end of it, Caesar wanted to execute all conspirators without trial, but Caesar refused to partake in such a tyrannical act. And then Cato the Younger, an unsufferable faggot, rose to speak in support of Cicero, helping him pass the bill, a Caesar with armed guards of all things. Caesar left that meeting in pure disgust, his worst fears about the Senate all but confirmed. His next step was to serve as propator in Hispania Ulterior, where he easily conquered two Iberian tribes, being hailed by his legions and gaining him the right for a triumph. To boot, he approached both Crassus and Pompey to help him get elected as consul. They were still somewhat rivals, but with Caesar pulling the strings, he got the first triumvirate going. When Cato heard of Caesar's victories in Hispania, he moved his triumphs date to conflict with the consular elections, forcing him to either choose one of them. It helps to know that Caesar was by then fucking Cato's sister on a daily basis, so that explains his pettiness a bit. Never want to choose glory over duty, Caesar gave up his right for a triumph in order to be elected as consul. It didn't go as planned though, as his running mate lost to Bibulus, one of Cato's lackeys, who would spend the entire year poking Caesar with a stick. We can summarize Caesar's consulship quite thoroughly. First, he moved to pass some land reforms, because if the popularis wouldn't shut up about it, then he might as well make it sure he wasn't stupid. But then Cato just kept speaking and speaking and speaking, completely filibustering it. So Caesar just kept the Senate's approval, which wasn't illegal by the way. Then Cato and Bibulus went to veto the whole thing, and the plebs, being plebs, greeted them by throwing shit at their heads. With his rivals humiliated, Caesar then would spend the entire rest of the year successfully passing bills in favor of his fellow triumvirs. It ended with Bibulus trying to annoy Caesar with religious omens to cancel all those bills, which would have worked were he not, you know, the Pontifex Maximus. Caesar then gave his farewell speech, and Bibulus got vetoed out of speaking by Clodius, one of Caesar's allies, which will be relevant behind the scenes. Additionally, Caesar married his daughter Julia to Pompey, his fourth wife by the way, and before the consulship ended, Caesar got himself three, count them, three provinces to rule, plus the right to pick his legates, one of which he made Labienus, or Labinus as I should say. Alright then, but what would Caesar do with a total of four le six legions in his command? Get this, he would attempt to civilize Gaul. <laughs> I know right, and I already hear you ask. But Dova, aren't Gauls uncivilizable? Uh, no, no, you're thinking about the germs, whom Caesar also clashed against. Britons too. The Gallic Wars were filled with such conflicts. It all started when a band of Helvetic Gauls threatened to invade one of Caesar's provinces. He marched to halt their advance, building a wall to stop them, forcing them to try and go around it. Caesar then set pursuit, confronting them in battle. There were some setbacks, like idiotic scouts giving false information and even more Gauls showing up, but at the end of the day, Caesar still won. This show of force much impressed the Gauls, who now asked Caesar to help kick out some invading Germanic king named Ariovistus, who was bringing in hundreds of thousands of germs across the Rhine. This Caesar could not allow. When facing Ariovistus, Caesar kindly asked him to go back the way he came from. He responded like all Germans do, immediately attacking him. The brawl later led to a full-on battle for the hill, which is where Crassus' son, Publius, helped to save the left flank, while Caesar broke through the germs in the right, 
forcing them to flee in fear back to their mud huts across the Rhine. After kicking the germs out, Caesar raised another two legions, without the Senate's approval. But who the fuck cares about what they approve anymore? Not Caesar, oh no. He was too busy now dealing with a Belgian coalition to care. Around 300,000 Gauls which Caesar dealt with by building a fortress on a hill beside a river, with ditches, walls, scorpions, it was awesome. The Belgae, too scared to attack, sent a division to cross the river and take over the bridge. Caesar then responded by leading a cavalry charge and slaughtering all those who crossed. Completely humiliated, the Belgae fled the field in fear. Caesar then set pursuit against their biggest tribe, the Nervi, whom hid in the woods until the legions started to build their camp, attacking them immediately afterwards. Facing imminent collapse, Caesar jumped into the fray, killing countless Gauls by himself, and single-handedly saving his legions until all the barbarians were surrounded and killed. Caesar then took this chance to return to his provinces, meeting with his fellow triumvirs in the Lucca Conference, where they agreed to have Pompey and Crassus run for consul to extend his governorship, and give themselves the provinces of Hispania and Syria. I should also say that Rome was in chaos right now with the whole Clodius thing, but I don't have time for that. It was the corrupt senate's fault, but that's not saying much, is it? Continuing to put his foot in Gaul's neck, Caesar sent two legions to different corners, one under Galba, a future emperor's great-grandfather, and the other under Publius Crassus. He just went there to buy some grain from the local Veneti tribe. And how did they answer it? By imprisoning his men. With this clear declaration of war, Caesar responded swiftly, invading their lands, freeing the hostages, putting their leaders to death and enslaving the population as he set fire to their mud huts. And not even their huge boats would be enough to escape his wrath, taken down by Decimus Brutus, one of Caesar's most loyal allies. Later, as he was dealing with some more Belgae tribes, two new German hordes would cross the Rhine, smelling the scent of civilization Caesar had brought with him. When Caesar confronted them, they were full of the usual we just wanna be your friends shit. He didn't fall for it for one second, only a fool would trust a germ. But it was only after his scouts were attacked that Caesar ordered his legions to expel them from Gaul, killing hundreds of thousands of germs along the way. Not that it was enough, it would never be enough. But then came the question of Britain, an unknown island that was sending supplies to rebelling tribes in Gaul. Caesar would lead two separate invasions of Britain. In the first one, his fleet was scattered in a storm, his plebeian troops were almost too cowardly to make an amphibious attack, and all Caesar found in the island were forests, unpredictable storms, and worst of all, Britons. He got back to Gaul, and after saving a few centuries that got stranded in hostile nervy lands, he set to try again now invading with 27,000 men, running a vicious campaign against Cassivellanus, whom he defeated in battle. But in the end, all he got was more trees, more storms, and a lot of dead Britons. An improvement for sure, but still. He set sail back to Gaul, choosing to leave Britain uncivilized. For now, anyway. So what was the situation in Gaul when he arrived? Chaos. Absolute chaos. An entire legion had been tricked into an ambush, and another two were engaged in battle. And then a messenger arrived, telling Caesar that not only was Cato doing everything in his power to revoke his army leadership, but that Caesar's only daughter Julia was dead, thus breaking his familial ties to Pompey. On top of all that, Crassus and his son had been killed by the Parthes in Carrey, who had now stolen their eagle standards. Just wonderful news. But in the end, Caesar, being Caesar, managed to crush the revolt regardless. He would return once again to the provinces to administer them, and perhaps have a bit of peace, later receiving another letter from Labinus. Make a guess. Yes, bloody chaos again. Caesar gathered his forces, dealing with a Gallic army that was nearing Narbo, and then traveling disguised as a Gaul to reach his army. He later learned that the whole thing was being orchestrated by a united Gallic uprising, led by Vercingetorix, whom would face Caesar at three events. Firstly, in the grueling siege of Avaricum, where the Romans had to build a ramp to climb the walls. It was raining, it was muddy, they were starving, it was shit. After the Romans inevitably climbed the walls, they slaughtered the entire city's population and no one can say it wasn't justified. Then they met at Gergovia, where Vercingetorix personally resided, which would prove impossible to take, given how Caesar's Gallic allies kept fucking switching sides. The final engagement happened at Elysia, and it's just the most hilarious shit ever. So Caesar had recently chased Vercingetorix through the city of Alesia, and instead of taking it, he built an entire wall encircling it. Then some wild Gauls showed up, and what did Caesar do? He built another set of walls around him. Vercingetorix tried everything his power to break out, having the cavalry charge in, which Caesar killed off, throwing all the soldiers at one point simultaneously, only to be repelled by Marcus Antonius, more on him later. And of course, attacking at all directions at once. They eventually did breach the walls, only to find themselves facing a Roman Testudo in front and Caesar's Germanic cavalry behind. Yes, Germans. 
Caesar scared even them into submission, only temporarily though. In the end, the outside army was slaughtered, and Vercingetorix surrendered the next day. Years later, the survivors would mount a revolt at Uxilodunum. It was defeated, of course, and Caesar was inclined to pardon them. But once he learned that the Sinones, the tribe responsible for sacking Rome long ago were the ones revolting, he lost all of his compassion, having all the rebel men rounded up and all of their hands chopped off, then releasing them back into the wild. Not only punishing them, but reminding them that Rome was there to stay, and so forever avenging the Gallic sack of Rome. In the honor of Camillus, let's see those casualties. really fucking good. But as good as genocide in the Gauls might feel, it is not the end of Caesar's journey. He might have defeated one of Rome's greatest external threats, but its inner demons were still alive and well. So let's get back to Rome, where the situation was something like this. Caesar did a great job in cultivating support among the plebeian masses, having them elect several tribunes of the plebs, who tried to extend Caesar's governorship long enough for him to run as consul again. Cato and company, of course, were screeching over this, dragging Pompey further and further against Caesar with their lies and deception, pitting friend against friend. Nevertheless, Caesar still tried to reach a peaceful agreement by sending Marcus Antonius to Rome, and just as they were on the verge of a resolution, Cato completely chipped out, ruining the whole negotiation. With tensions rising, the Senate declared Caesar an enemy of the state, and gave Pompey full power over Rome. It was a fateful night when Caesar received the news from Rome. Camping out at Ravenna, he stared across the Rubicon River. He faced a difficult dilemma. He could either surrender to Pompey and let Cato's senators continue to drag Rome into decline, or he could take up arms, march on Rome as Sulla did, and restore Rome to the right path. And then he realized it wasn't a hard choice at all, ordering his legions to cross the Rubicon. Meanwhile, back in Gaul, Labinus was overseeing the legions. And when he received word of this, unable to understand the necessity of forceful change, Labinus chose to betray Caesar, leaving Gaul and joining up with Pompey's forces, whom, right about now, was shitting his toga as Caesar approached Rome with just one legion, choosing to flee the city, followed by the Senate in droves. A guy named Domitius tried to delay Caesar midway at Corfinum, but his troops just betrayed him, joining Caesar's side, who then pardoned Domitius, quite pathetic really. But he did make Caesar fail to catch Pompey in time, as they held up in Brundisium until they sailed away to Greece, leaving Italy in Caesar's control. He later returned to Rome, installing Marcus Antonius in power and said, okay, okay, alright, Mark Antony. Happy? Gods, I hate English pronunciations. Uh, okay, okay, alright, back to the Civil War. With the Civil War having just begun, Caesar immediately set towards dealing with Pompey's legions in Hispania, defeating them at the Battle of Lerda having all legionnaires pardoned. Such mercy would come back to bite him, and I'm not just talking about Domitius, who then tried to face Caesar again, but he was just ignored. After a string of defeats and three lost legions, one of Caesar's veteran legions actually revolted, but a single threat of decimation was enough to calm them down. We can thank Crassus for that. Caesar was then elected dictator through the help of a senator named Lapidus, who will be very relevant next video. <laughs> well, not really. He exists. Yeah, yeah, he exists. As he was about to cross the Adriatic Sea, Bibulus showed up with a fleet to blockade him. Not that it actually achieved anything, Caesar slipped right through it and a few months later Bibulus just died. I think I'll make a point of using the Bibulus award from now on. Thing is, Pompey had amassed a huge army in Greece, and together with Labinus and Domitius he faced against Caesar and Mark Antony at Pharsalus. It would have been close to a stalemate had Pompey's cavalry not been ambushed by a wall of spears, leading to his right flank getting annihilated and his Greekoid army destroyed. With this massive victory, Caesar graciously pardoned both Cicero and Brutus. Yes, that one. 
Remember how Caesar was fucking Kato's sister on a daily basis? Yeah, he's the result of that. Needless to say, the Caesar loved him as a son. And speaking of Cato, he went to Africa to raise a new army and continue being a cunt, while Pompey fled to Egypt to do the same. Caesar went after Pompey first, seeking to pardon his old friend. And as he was received by the Egyptians, he was greeted with Pompey's head. This struck Caesar deep, lost in both sorrow and anger. Okay, three, two, one. You are enemies. He was a consul of Rome! Consumed by rage, Caesar brought down his troops into the city, taking over the royal palace and dealing with the, by then, revolting population. This is where we get to Cleopatra, by the way, the archetypal foreign seductress come slut, and a reincarnation of Dido as well. So I guess we know what to expect from this particular Greek woman. Cleopatra made her first appearance by sneaking to Caesar's room inside a sack, hoping it would impress him. But once the reincarnation of Dido met with Aeneas' direct descendant, she immediately fell in love with his divine beauty. And Caesar just so happens to need a cum dumpster at the time. Let's take this chance to see how Mark Antony is doing in Rome. What a mad lad. Back to Egypt. To help him out, Caesar sent several letters to eastern allies, demanding help from them. It eventually reached one of Mithridates' sons, who was such a weak-willed coward that he bent to Caesar's will instantly, sending him 18,000 Greeks to help him out. Caesar then proceeded to sneak out of the city, take over this army, and crush the Egyptians at the Battle of the Nile, installing Cleopatra as pharaoh and getting her to pay all of Egypt's debts, and then gifting her Cyprus, like a boss pays off a cheap whore with a coin toss. But here's the deal, remember that other son that had betrayed Mithridates and made him kill himself? Yeah, he was now rebelling against Rome and trying to restore his father's kingdom. Thing is, he was just as cowardly as his brother. For once he heard Caesar was marching on him, he immediately sued for a truce, which was promptly ignored, culminating in the Battle of Zella, where Pharnaces would idiotically charge at Caesar. I mean, seriously, he just charged uphill. Needless to say that he was killed and the campaign was over in what? Five days? Weni, Widi, Wiki, as Caesar said. Arriving back in Italy, Caesar had Mark Antony cut down on the lions for a bit, having Lepidus elected as consul. And guess what? He had another veteran legion revolt on him. But this time Caesar just granted them dispensation. They couldn't bring themselves to desert their divine general, so decided to follow him to Africa, where he jumped into the sand to embrace the land. There he would face not only Cato, but a corrupted Scipio, the Numidian king Juba, and Libinus once again. But by then Caesar had got himself a true-born Scipio, and now the tables were even. The battle itself would have been a stalemate, had the enemy's elephants not crashed into their own troops, causing enough confusion to have them all slaughtered. After this defeat, both Scipio and Juba would kill themselves, and Cato, unwilling to live in a world led by that sister fucker Caesar, he stabbed himself, but failed to die. So he just kept tearing out his intestines until he passed out. A painful death for a painful cunt. Lebinus, on the other hand, just went to Spain to fight another day. Not that Caesar knew. He instead went back to Rome to celebrate the victory, being elected dictator for 10 years and being awarded a total of 4 triumphs. One for genociding the Gauls, another for making Egypt his bitch, the third for putting Mithridates' sons in place, and another one for making Cato kill himself. Caesar then shared his fortunes with all of Rome, awarding each soldier one silver talent and every citizen four months worth of wages, and most importantly, refilling the Senate with his veteran centurions, allied Italian elites, and a host of civilized Gauls. Because, thanks to him, those now existed. On top of all that, Caesar also changed the Roman calendar to not be based on the moon, but the sun. He couldn't quite put it to words, but there was something about it that seemed quite... divine. And then he remembered, the Venus is still alive. Way back in Hispania, he managed to rally the legions Caesar had pardoned earlier, allying himself with both of Pompey's sons, Gnaeus and Sextus. Caesar then faced them at the Battle of Munda, which was very hard fought, requiring Caesar to take to the battlefield once again. And despite Libinus's best efforts, he was defeated once more, with Gnaeus being killed off afterward. Sextus, however, escaped capture, as he would for the following decade. After this victory, Caesar would be joined by his great-nephew, Octavian, whose bravery and loyalty greatly impressed his great-uncle. But more on him later. A lot more, actually. But nonetheless, we can finally say it. The Civil War was over. Caesar returned Rome a hero, celebrating a final triumphal march, having saved the Republic from the parasites within. Even so, that didn't mean Rome was safe. 
there were still many threats to be dealt with. The Parthians remained unpunished after killing Crassus and stealing his eagle standards. The Black Sea steppes were a lawless gateway for invading eastern barbarians. And above all, the Germanic question had not yet been answered. To deal with all of these threats, Caesar was named dictator for life by the Senate, immediately starting preparations for his Parthian campaign. Oh, if only the great Romans of the past could see Caesar now. Camillus, Cincinnatus, Brutus, yes, Brutus. The hero whose descendant Caesar had fathered and loved unconditionally. The one he had pardoned after allied with Pompey and Caesar's last living child. Being yet another patrician casualty of senatorial corruption and deception, Brutus was used as a puppet by the lawful dictator's worst enemies. For the civil war might have ended, but the strife of order and chaos never did. The final affront happened at Lupercalia, a festival that celebrated the founding brothers of Rome. To take part in this tradition, Mark Antony undressed himself, joining the priests in whipping the woman to increase their fertility. Until he found a crown laying on the ground. Seeking to piss off the Senate, he insisted on giving the crown to Caesar, knowing well that he would refuse. Twice more he tried, but Caesar just wouldn't have it. He was disgusted by the idea of being a monarch. For he knew that no king ruled Rome, but Jupiter himself. The crowds cheered for their hero. But just as his unrivaled accomplishments and republican virtues made him popular with the plebs, so had it driven his enemies to the edge of envy and resentment. They were revolted by the existence of someone so perfect, even more so one whom they owed their lives to. Unable to bear the thought of Caesar returning to Rome triumphant once more, a conspiracy was born, led by a senator named Cassius, with Brutus at his side. At first this just doesn't make sense. Why would the descendant of the father of the Republic betray the one who did the most to save it? Well, it's a tragic thing. Much like Cato had corrupted Pompey, so did Cassius corrupt Brutus, with the endless lies and deception at their disposal. Arrogantly calling themselves the Liberators, they agreed on a date for the deed, the Ides of March. The gods could see the conspiracy unfolding, and took it upon themselves to warn Aeneas' descendant of his fate. Before leaving for his final senate meeting, his wife told him of a dream where he was covered in blood. His friends reported the arrival of many evil women. Mars himself showed up to straight up warn him. This all troubled Caesar greatly, making him delay his departure. Until Decimus Brutus showed up, who had already been corrupted by the senate as well. Decimus guilt tripped Caesar for scorning the senate, playing into his pure patrician heart to ignore his friend's advice and go anyway. The day had come. The senate had been relocated into a theater Pompey had previously built, in order to weaken Caesar by reminding him of his deceased friend. At first, nothing was amiss. The senators began making ridiculous requests. He pretended to consider them, not to hurt their feelings, politics as usual. And then it began. 26 times. 26 times the senator stabbed Caesar, but still couldn't bring him down. He refused to die. He refused to let the Republic be destroyed by those traitors. But who was among those traitors, if not his son, Brutus? His betrayal struck Caesar deep. The 27th stab proved the only one to be fatal. Julius Caesar was dead. After a lifetime of spilling blood and sweat for the sake of the Republic, he was now treacherously murdered by those who deemed him a tyrant. And now, would the Republic continue to spiral into chaos? Would the light of Rome continue fading, destined to be extinguished by its enemies? Was there a hero to take Caesar's place, when Rome needed one most? These were all questions that would define an age. The Age of Augustus.